Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our course. I'm glad you're with us today. Hydration is our topic. And I have a feeling I'm gonna, it's going to blow your mind a little bit um, where we're going to go with this because it blew my mind <laughs> once I started to really understand the importance of water in the body. And it's way more than the old notion of get eight glasses of water a day, which I don't even recommend now. And we'll talk about that later. So some fascinating stuff with hydration. And I just want to begin with reiterating the fact that the whole point of this course, which it is an introductory course, so it's not a super deep dive, but hopefully deep enough to um, give you enough of the why behind the four pillars for you to go and implement it. Um, <clears throat> but really the, the whole point of this course is to build your internal terrain. And this COVID virus, coronavirus thing is a great example. We are so focused on the germ, so fo focused on the bug, and we need to be focused on the host. It's the host that really matters, the host's defense system, immune system, your just internal functions, the way your body works. Um, a well-nourished, hydrated, um, peaceful host will combat these viruses easily. Um, and again, even the standard American person who's not stewarding their health, 95% of these cases with COVID are mild to moderate, only small percentage are severe. So I don't want to get too distracted with that. I'll probably speak more to that at the end just because that's the season that we're in. But just rest assured, what you're learning is the foundational uh, components to a healthy body to ward off all the different bugs, including COVID. So. Let's go with hydration. Here's just some basic facts on water. It's good that we all start kind of on the same page here. Um, and it's amazing when you read through some of these facts that doctors really aren't taught much about water at all. I mean, obviously we're taught to rehydrate someone who's significantly dehydrated, but a lot of these facts and details, I mean, if the body's 70% water by weight, as you see here, or 99% of the molecules. So if you lined up every single molecule in your body, and just started counting them, one, two, three, four. every tenth molecule would be something else. And all the ones in between are water. It's amazing how much water um, is in the, in the body. And you can see here 85% of the blood is water, 75% of the muscle, 20% of your bone. I mean, we're a big bag of water. We're a walking bag of water. It's fascinating. And when you start to even look at the physics of water, that's what's more fascinating, is it defies physics. It defies all the natural properties that most molecules, all other compounds and molecules have to obey. So the scientists, so far, they found 70 different properties in water that defy physics. Here's an example of one of them. Um, water's the only molecule that cannot be compressed. And it expands when it's both heated and cooled. If you think about that, if you heat it up and get steam, those water molecules in steam are, are expanded, but so is ice. Ice, act, when you freeze water molecules, they expand also. Fascinating stuff. No other molecule acts like water. Another interesting fact most people don't know, even uh, most doctors, that the water inside your cell is not H2O. It changes, it starts to share electrons and actually changes molecular structure into H3O2. And H3O2 has some very unique properties to it. And it really turns out it's what runs our cell. I mean, it, it, what, that is what gives the cell energy to do what it needs to do. And as you'll find out um, more towards the end of the presentation today, it, it, um, that water holds information. It stores and holds information more than any supercomputer ever could. It's really cool. And that's probably the coolest part of the whole lecture today. But first, let's start with the basics. So this is what I learned and what probably most of you know and definitely your doctors would know. Um, it's the basics. It's what I call the Ben Edwards MD 1.0. This is your conventional education um, that you need water to stay hydrated. And when you don't have it, then you're dehydrated. And dehydration, um, doctors know, will cause preterm labor. I mean, that was like the first thing when a labor and delivery nurse would call me back when I used to deliver babies. And somebody was in having kind of some contractions a little prematurely. They, sh they weren't ready for delivery yet. They weren't far enough along. You just give them a bag of saline, almost always. A bag of saline, maybe a little Benadryl and Tylenol, but basically it's the bag of saline and their contractions would go away. They could go home. 
Um, uh, and when I was taking care of patients in the nursing home, when the nurse would call, Mrs. Jones is acting a little weird, a little different. It was almost a, always a UTI, and the UTI was almost always there because of dehydration. You know, little old ladies in the nursing home, they just don't drink enough fluids. Um, so it's one of the leading causes of hospital admission and from nursing home to hospital. And then a mission trip I went on, we're probably all aware of cholera and how that causes significant diarrhea in the kiddos and, and the adults too really die from the dehydration. If you can just keep those kids properly rehydrated while their body's flushing that cholera out, they can survive. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these kids don't have access to, to good hydration. And that was evident during that mission trip to Africa. So that's the real, just the basics. I mean, I think everyone really understands it. We just need fluid to stay hydrated. But then as I progressed into more integrative functional medicine, um, got introduced to some other research and some other doctors, and here's some of them here, and started to learn this deeper layer um, to my hydration education. Um, Dr. Batman is what I call him, as you can see there. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. <laughs> um, but his book, The Body's Many Cries for Water, that was the first book I read about water. And it's an old book. It's probably 20 years old now. And, um, and then Gina Bria, Gerald Pollack, and Tom Cowan, um, I'm going to go through each one of these individually on their own slides. But it was just this um, small, in a way, small incremental um, learning steps, but they built on each other to get us to where we are today, understanding that water um, is probably the foundational nutrient, if you want to call that, for health. So let's, let's look at each one of these a little closer. Dr. Batman, um, I call him. Um, when you read Dr. Batman's book, oops, sorry, he basically um, lays out a really good case for these basic diseases, if you want to call them diseases or symptoms. He can relate through the research how these are all related to just dehydration. Um, I think a good visual you can understand is those the disc in between each vertebra. You've got a disc or in between your you're the two bones that make up a joint, say your, your leg bones that make up your knee joint, there's cushion there, there's cartilage. Well, when the body's dehydrated, it's going to send chemical signals out to pull water out of certain tissues that are considered non-vital um, to keep your more vital tissues hydrated. That would be your brain, your heart, your kidney. And so you're going to pull water out of that cartilage. So instead of a nice, plump, thick disc between each vertebra or cartilage in your joints, that's going to um, become dehydrated. It's going to shrink. Think of a, a plum versus a prune. Um, so something as simple as that, the body just conserving water when it's chronically dehydrated to save vital organs and processes at the expense of non-vital. And it can lead to pain in the joints and degenerative disc disease. But he goes all through the book talking about how um, the whole histamine response with allergies, reflux, migraines, um, a number of different symptoms you can um, resolve with just good hydration, which good hydration we'll talk about later, also includes good electrolyte, good mineral um, intake. Gina Bria wrote a great book called Quench. And so Gina Bria is an anthropologist. So she went and studied um, historically how did people, groups, and tribes around the world hydrate themselves, specifically in areas that were very arid. Um, and she even went and studied some of these um, tribes today in South America and Australia. And basically what she notes in her book is that everyone used to eat their water, not just drink their water. So the foods people used to consume are very hydrating. She gives an example in her book of a tribe in South Africa, and they're known um, for running like 50-mile marathons. And they do it with chia seeds. So basically chia seeds are tiny little, almost like a a sesame seed or poppy seed, um, but they soak up water. They hold water. So if you get a tablespoon of chia seed and put it in a glass with some water or any kind of liquid and leave it overnight, it'll just soak that thing up like, and it'll be like a sponge. Well, these, these folks would eat that chia seed pudding, I call it, um, and that water would slowly release out of their digestive tract from that chia seed sponge into their body all throughout the day. And it wasn't just chia seed. There are other things um, that um, help that hold water, other foods that hold water. So all these indigenous tribes she found um, really ate their water. And she recommends, and I agree with, with her, that half your consumption of water should be from the food you eat, not just from what you drink. And probably the second major point of her book is movement is key to hydration. Um, and I'll show you a video here in a second. And she talks about this doctor We'll just go on to it here. Yeah, because I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I need to look at this. 
Dr. Jean-Claude Gumberto. So Dr. Gumberto is a French hand surgeon, pretty famous hand surgeon. And w one day he was doing a video of uh, arthroscopic surgery. So that's where you just poke a couple ho holes in the wrist and one holes for the camera, the other holes for your instrument, your tool to do the surgery. And he was trying to video this surgery for teaching purposes. And the whole screen and really all the tissue he was working with was just too red from the blood. It was too red tinged. So he had his nurse put um, a blood pressure cuff up above on the upper arm and tighten it up to cut off the blood supply momentarily. And so when that happened and when the blood stopped coming down to the fingers and the, and the wrist and hand, all of a sudden that his uh, camera uh, shot just lit up as a, the, the blood got out, he could see this glistening uh, spider web like material that we knew that was there, but it's called um, fascia. But what he saw were these water droplets coming out of it. Just like think of those soaker hoses that have a million little um, holes throughout them and all those little water droplets that come through that soaker hose, that's what he found. And so that led to this, um, now we totally understand, our body hydrates itself or irrigates itself. Every cell of your body really gets its water from the fascia, from this spider web like material that I'm about to show you a video of. But back to Gina Bria's book, the second kind of main take home point from her book is you got to move because when you're stationary, sitting, sedentary all day long, that fascia gets stagnant. It kind of gets frozen up and you don't irrigate as well. So when you bend and twist and stretch and get up and move and squat and all these things, when you just move, you actually are, it's kind of like wringing that fascia out, like wringing a towel and the water will drip out of there better. So you need to eat your water and you need to move in order to irrigate every cell of the body. And that's really the point of her book. And she gives some great recipes on different smoothies and chia seed pudding and, and different foods. Um, you know, simple tips like if you're going to eat a piece of pizza, which is dehydrating, eat an apple with it or eat some salad with it. You want to try to balance hydrating with dehydrating or just don't eat much dehydrating. And the standard American diet is very dehydrating. The standard of American life is dehydrating. When you're in fight or flight mode, your heart rate's up, your respiratory rate's up, and you're actually breathing out more water. Um, you know, you could get up to your mirror to some glass and breathe, and we all know condensation is there. So every breath you take that you exhale, there's water in it. And when you're in fight or flight mode, more of that's coming out. Um, Okay, I want to show you the video. It, there's some podcasts there I also mentioned here. Um, and the hydrationfoundation.org is Gina's website. And the You're the Cure, we interviewed her on there. So I'd recommend you go listen to that. I want to show you real quick. And this is on Dr. Gumberto's website. Um, so he has a number of videos here. We're going to try to keep it um, pretty clean so that we don't see too much blood. I know some people have trouble with blood. Interior architecture, that's the one. Um, it's not gonna have volume to it, but you can at least, I think, get a good sense of what I'm talking about with that spider web material. Here we go, let me blow this up. So this is just under the skin. So you see the spider web like material that's called the fascia, and it's all throughout the body. Um, it's around the organs. It's around the muscles. I mean, you probably have seen similar stuff when you're dealing with your, your chicken breast. So there you can see, I don't know where exactly in the body he's at here, but he's pulling those forceps up and you can see this very tough, flexible material. And this is everywhere. This is everywhere throughout your muscles, under your skin, wrapped around your organs. Um, and we now know even the acupuncture meridians, the traditional Chinese medicine, um, there you go, you see the spider web like material. So you can kind of see a water droplet there too. That The water travels through these tiny little, um, I'll call them vessels, I guess, but through this fascia, through the spider web material. Fascinating stuff. Okay, I think that's enough for now, maybe. There's, you can kind of tell where the water's at there. Again, this is called fascia, F-A-S-C-I-A, -S I believe. Okay. And that, again, is Dr. Um, Jean-Claude Gumberto. Y'all can look at him on, on your internet browser. Okay, back to the slideshow here. 
Moving on, then, so the next guy I learned from, Dr. Gerald Pollack, he's also uh, interviewed him on the podcast too. You could search for that um, on the website. I'll show you how to do that at the end of the show or end of the presentation today. But Pollock was really the one that set this whole thing in motion because 20 plus years ago, he pretty much discovered this, what we call fourth phase of water. So everybody knows about liquid, um, vapor, and solid. But this fourth phase, and it's a jello-like state of water, he, no one knew about it, he discovered it. And the way he discovered it, he was working on a cardiac muscle cell under the microscope, um, and he accidentally punctured through the cell membrane with his pipette. And it, the cell maintained its integrity, its, its shape. It didn't just extrude all its water like you would expect, like a water balloon, you poke a hole in it, all the water would squirt out. That did not happen, and he was kind of shocked by that. So then he poked another hole, and he poked another hole, and the cell continued to maintain its shape, and, it, and the water didn't come out. So he called some of his colleagues around the world that he knew were pretty smart cellular biologists, and it turns out no one really had studied the water inside a cell. No one really knew the properties of it. So he went on to start studying that, and he's, he's the one that discovered it's really H3O2, and it has a, a whole unique um, um, physiology to it. Um, I call it structured water. I think most people call it structured water. Dr. Pollock um, first coined it EZ water or exclusion zone water, and there's, there's lots of other names for it. But Dr. Pollock's book, The Fourth Phase of Water, if you really want to geek out on this, you could read that. It's um, pretty deep. Um, and, of course, he's on YouTube and all over the place. But he's kind of the, the godfather of the whole structured water movement. And then um, moved on to Thomas Cowan. He's a medical doctor out in California, um, kind of one of my mentors. I've interviewed him a number of times also on the podcast. Those, these are his three books. And in a nutshell, um, and this does get a little complicated, and, and if we have time, I'll take the deeper dive. But what he's um, showing in all three of these, these books, one is on heart disease, one's on cancer, and one's on autoimmune disease. And they all boil down to the same thing, the intracellular water has to be structured. It needs to be H3O2. There are things that we do, ways that we live and foods that we eat, toxins we expose ourselves to, um, sedentary lifestyle, EMFs, modern life basically and diet, destructure your intracellular water. Get it from that nice H3O2 that has a charge to H2O that doesn't have a charge. Um, and he explains it very, very clearly in the book and I would highly recommend that you um, at least listen to the radio interviews. And the books are really short and to the point um, and really fascinating and eye-opening. And it will make you want to consider everything you do on your day-to-day -day routine. Is this bringing structure to my intracellular water or is it destructuring my intracellular water? But I can just tell you the basics are you want to eat real food. Um, you want to get up and move. You want to get sunlight. When the sun hits your skin, it actually restructures the water in your skin. Um, you don't want to be in sympathetic dominant mode. Fight or flight mode will destructure that water inside your cell. He relates all that, though, to heart disease and to cancer and to autoimmune disease. Um, okay. So that was kind of 2.0. That was some new fascinating stuff I didn't understand, obviously, in med school because they didn't teach that to me. Um, it brought a, a lot of healing and um, a lot of benefit to my patients when we started um, encouraging them, teaching them, supporting them in their hydration and eating their water and in movement and trying to bring um, their stress levels down. And all that was great. Um, but then things started to connect on a deeper level um, and this is really along, uh, goes hand in hand with the peace pillar. And so this is what I would call the Ben Edwards MD 3.0. Um, and it's more in that quantum physics realm, which I'm definitely not a quantum physicist, but what we're going to talk about um, has been proven out in that realm of science. And if you want to go dive deep into that, you could. So I was introduced to a Dr. Emoto um, in Japan. And I'll show you his book in a minute. And then um, Dr. Jacques Bimbanis, Luc Montagnier, and Dr. Cropeland. And we're going to go through each one of these. Um, and we're going to get into some very fascinating um, topics as far as water and the ability of water to hold memory and what that means for your health. So first, Dr. Emoto. Um, he was a Japanese doctor. He's since passed away. And 
I don't recall how he decided to do this or what um, initiated this thought in his mind, but he decided to take water from different sources and put a, uh, or freeze a drop of water, put it under a slide and look at it. And as you can see these examples here, beautiful um, crystal snowflake patterns when you freeze a drop of water. Um, but then he started getting water from sources that were contaminated, like a, a polluted river. And what he noticed was that water looked a lot different. The architectural shape and structure of that looked different than water that came from a pristine source like a glacier or a clean mountain spring fed river. Then, besides just coming from a contaminated source, um, he started exposing the water, and this is where you're going to have to open your mind a little bit, because I know the first time I heard it, I thought, this is crazy, but to words. Um, so, as you can see here, words that are more positive, like thank you, wisdom, truth, eternal, angel, I love you, peace, versus more negative words, like you fool, and I hate you, and you make me sick. Um, the negative words impacted the shape of the water. So that's basically what Dr. Emoto's contribution, which is these pictures, these photographs of frozen water coming from different sources, influenced by something outside the water molecule, both physically and, and vibrationally. The spoken word is a vibrational energy, and it changed the shape of the water. That's it. So that was cool and fascinating and very intriguing, but what does that mean for us? Well, let's take it a step further. And Dr. Jacques Benveniste um, is a doctor, and he's passed away too. He's from France, um, and he really added to this concept of the memory of water. So what Dr. Benveniste was famous for he, um, was his work in immunology, allergy testing in particular. So if any of you have been tested to see if you're allergic to dog dander or tree pollen or ragweed or whatever. Um, one of the ways you can test for that is draw a patient's blood, send the blood to the lab, and then the lab will mix the patient's blood with that, um, we call it an antigen, but just think of it as a little bit of that uh, protein like dog dander. So they'll mix a little dog dander with the blood and then they'll measure the histamine. If, if you had a big histamine release from the cells inside your blood. Let me draw this out for you here. Um, so let's just do blue. You've got a cell. Um, they're called mast cells. Mast cells hold histamine. Histamine is a chemical in the body. Um, H there, sorry. H for histamine. So on these cells you've got receptors. We've talked about receptors before. They're like keyholes. So keys into a keyhole. So if you have the receptor for dog dander um, and then you put in um, dog dander that has a certain shape and it fits perfectly into that shape, into that keyhole, when that connection is made, then the mast cell degranulates is a scientific name for that, but what it means is it dumps all the histamine out. So now you've got all this histamine floating around the blood and that histamine response, that's the itchy eyes, watery eyes, sneezing, runny nose, all that allergy response. Um, and that's why you can take an antihistamine like Benadryl, Claritin, Allegra, Zyrtec, um, and it'll block that. And then you won't have those symptoms. But bottom line, back to Dr. Benveniste, what he did was perfect this, um, this particular test where you could take the patient's blood, get the mast cells, and um, test them to all these different proteins, dog dander and different pollens, and see if you got degranulation, okay? So that was it. If you degranulated, then you're allergic. So what Ben Venice um, did, well, actually as a colleague of his, one of his employees, one of his junior doctors in his lab, came to him and said, hey, I want to do this same test, but I want to do it on, on a homeopathic dilution. So I want to take the patient's blood and expose it to a homeopathic dilution of dog dander. So what does that mean? Well, homeo homeopathy um, is a branch of medicine that's now um, really not available in, in the United States. Interesting side note, the American um, Association of Homeopathic, American Homeopathic Association, AHA, predated the AMA, American Medical Association, I think 1845 versus 1848. Um, in 1900, there were 22 homeopathic medical schools in America. By 1923, there, it was down to two, and now there's none. 
but homeopathy used to be widely accepted and used. In fact, I was reading recently on uh, New York City, 1918, they survived that big um, flu pandemic at a much uh, um, higher degree than other cities. Their death rate was much lower than a lot of other metropolitan areas. And the commissioner, the New York City health commissioner at that time, um, was a homeopathic physician. And there were three homeopathic uh, hospitals in New York City in 1918. And the homeopaths back then, um, everyone knew the homeopaths were saying, don't use aspirin. Aspirin had just come off patent. And it was widely available. And all the allopathic or medical MDs were advising people to use a lot of aspirin, up to 25 tablets a day. And the homeopaths were saying, no, don't do that. Use a homeopathic preparation instead. Um, it's interesting, um, the death rate in allopathic hospitals was a lot higher and autopsies showed a lot of bleeding in the lung, which was a little unusual for flu. And we know aspirin will cause bleeding, kind of a side tangent there. The point is homeopathy used to be widely used, widely known, widely accepted, but then it wasn't. Um, it was ridiculed and basically um, everything standardized to allopathic medicine. But in Germany, in France, and places in Europe, it's still available. So there's a homeopathic doctor in Dr. Ben Venice's lab, and he said, I want to do a homeopathic dilution. So what this is, they take the dog dander, put it into a vial of water, pure water, put some dog dander in it, like a drop of dog dander, shake that bottle up, and then get one drop of it, transfer that to another vial of pure water, shake that up, and then take one drop of that and transfer it to another vial of pure water, and continue to do that, and by like the 10th time you do that, it's something to the um, effect of one to the billionth dilution, where there is no more physical dog dander left in that water. It's just water. That's a homeopathic dilution. So Ben Venice allowed this doctor to do that. He took the homeopathic dilution that had no more dog dander, mixed it with the patient's blood, got the exact same mast cell degranulation, the histamine response. So Ben Venice was shocked. Couldn't believe that. How could just water, this huge dilution that just had water in it, cause that reaction? So we had them repeat it and repeat it again, and they repeated it multiple times. And then Ben Venice was convinced, obviously, it's irrefutable. The water itself is transferring information somehow. He didn't know back then, well, now we know. It's an EMF transmission. Um, but the water was holding that memory, or you know, holding that information of the dog dander. He went to the journal Nature to publish it. Nature kind of laughed at him, said there's no way. If this is true, it totally will turn science on its head. Um, and they argued kind of back and forth for about two years. And finally, Nature did publish it with a big asterisk editorial comment that, you know, we, we don't understand this or no fully and we, we're not endorsing it. And, and basically, Ben Venice was ridiculed greatly for it. Spent the, rest ten, the remaining 10 years of his life defending his name, basically, and he died early. And then we move on to this guy, Luc Montagnier. I'm going to zoom up so you can see his name a little better. Professor uh, Luc Montagnier. He won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2008. He was awarded that because he discovered uh, HIV virus. Um, so Montagnier is well respected. And, you know, if Montagnier says something, people are going to believe it. So Montagnier decided to try to replicate Benveniste's work. But what he did, he took it a little a step further. He took HIV DNA, the, the DNA um, strand that's associated with HIV, diluted it, diluted it, diluted it, same way, 10 times, so there's no more DNA left. And then he took a drop of that water, and in his lab, he can measure the electromagnetic frequency of any uh, substance. So everything, um, all substances on the Earth vibrate at a certain frequency. Um, you know, this desk, this computer, this jar of water, everything has a vibrational energy to it, um, and he can measure that. It's kind of like a fingerprint. And so he took that dilution, took that drop of water, measured it, got a fingerprint for the HIV um, DNA, and then he transmitted that information via email to another lab in, another, in Italy, and they reconstituted the HIV virus from that DNA, just from the signal from the EMF fingerprint that came out of that water. Fascinating study and basically just confirmed homeopathy and confirmed Ben Venice's work and, and a lot of other people's work that the water is holding information. There's no doubt about it. 
Then we did get to Dr. Cromplin in Stuttgart, and what he showed was um, some fascinating work too. He, he kind of did like Dr. Emoto did. He took water from different sources and saw the beautiful nature of the, uh, he didn't freeze the water. He would put a drop of water on a slide, let it dry, and then look at the shape. But then he would put a flower into water and let the flower sit in the water for some amount of time, take a drop of that water, and it, it would, um, it was replicatable. The, the water would have a certain architectural shape and symmetry um, consistent with that flower every single time. It was really interesting, and, and you can look up his work on the internet. But the point I want to bring out is he would get all his lab staff around a table. There'd be one source of water, you know, one jar of water. Everybody would be asked to get their own individual pipette, get a drop of the water, put it on their slide, let it dry, and look at it. And what he noted was everybody's drop looked different from everybody else's drop, even though it came from the same source, same jar of water. Um, and he had them do it repeatedly, and it was um, consistent. Everybody's drop looked consistently the same for them uniquely, but different from everybody else. So what he concluded was <laughs> there's something about the individual person's um, energy or their thoughts, their mind, something unique about that person is changing the shape of the water. So we have all that information now and understanding that water does hold memory, um, that words and thoughts can impact water. So when we apply that to the work of some other um, doctors outside of the whole water um, research, and I'm going to talk about this Dr. Bruce Lipton, Biology of Belief. And I don't recall if I've told you about Bruce, Dr. Lipton before or not, so bear with me if I have, if I'm repeating myself. And, and I've interviewed him too on the radio. It's probably one of my favorite interviews, so I definitely go back and, and listen to that one. But Lipton is a neat guy. Um, back in the 60s, he discovered epigenetics, basically. He discovered that the genes are not in charge of everything. Your genes are not your destiny. So Watson and Crick had just discovered the double helix um, DNA shape um, in the mid-1950s. And then in mid-1960s, Lipton came out and said, wait a minute. I'd, and what he did was take embryonic stem cells and he allowed them to grow in a different environment. So an embryonic stem cell, when a sperm and egg come together to make a cell, you have one cell, then it divides into two, then two go into four, and four go into eight, and so on. It's the same um, genetic material. It copies that DNA and divides, and copies and divides. So it's the same cell, basically. So he took some of these cells, and he put them into different petri, three different Petri dishes. In the first Petri dish, he changed the temperature in the Petri dish environment. The second Petri dish, he changed the oxygen content, oxygen level. The third Petri dish, he changed the pH. So these are external influences, external inputs, and he let those cells divide and divide and divide and divide. And what he found was the first Petri dish ended up, um, those cells changed into skin cells. The next Petri dish, it was bone, and the next one was muscle or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but they were different cell lines is what I'm getting at. And his whole dis point of that discovery in the 1960s was that genes are turned on or turned off cells are impacted by external environmental influence. It seems probably like common sense to you, but to scientists and the doctors, it was revolutionary. And unfortunately, no one really listened, um, but he continued to study this epigenetic um, phenomenon. And fast forward 30, 40 years, now some of his latest work and what caused him to publish this book, Biology of Belief, is he did a study um, because, it, yes, vitamins and minerals and toxins and all these things that can impact your cell membrane and, and, and the cellular and the genes being turned on and off. But he took it a step further um, and proved how our thoughts will turn genes on and off. And what he did was he took some people, I'll call it Miss Jones and Miss Smith, um, and he put them into the same environment, so had the same external influence and stressors on them. And these stressful situations caused both Miss Jones and Miss Smith to flip into fight or flight mode, the sympathetic dominant fight or flight. Um, but then what he saw was Miss Smith would flip back into parasympathetic, into the peace mode within a few minutes, where Miss Jones stayed in fight or flight all day long. So what he concluded from that 
um, experiment was it's not just your external factors. It's not just the stressful letter you get in the mail or argument you had with your spouse or your boss firing you or COVID-19 fearful newscast. It's not just all the external um, stimuli coming in, but it's an internal processing that. It's your thoughts. It's your interpretation. It's the goggles that you're looking through. How are you seeing the world? How are you seeing these circumstances? How are you seeing this whatever bad thing just happened in your life? How are you inter interpreting that? What set of goggles are you using? That, that is the point of that Biology of Belief book is he is saying that there are false beliefs that cause you to see things in a certain way. They'll keep you in fight or flight and therefore um, be more harmful to your genetic expression and cellular function. And there's another belief you could have that's not a false belief that will cause your body to f operate normally in that peaceful mode. So that, when you, when you have that understanding, and then Caroline Leaf, her book takes it um, deeper um, and, and quotes more science specifically on our thoughts impacting genetic expression. And then you'd look at Alexander Lloyd's newest book, The Memory Code, which was recently released. And man, this just all starts to come together full circle. Um, basically, Memory Code, what he's saying is these thoughts that we have about ourselves um, are rooted in, typically rooted in, a memory that we have from our upbringing. So some event happens in our life, it evokes an emotion, and then we interpret all that through a certain lens, influenced by our upbringing, and influenced by our parents, our culture, our religion, or whatever. You know, lots of different things of, uh, in your life. Well, if those um, things that influence your interpretation of that thought aren't lined up with the truth, then you're going to have a, a memory that is not accurate, I'll say. And again, this is getting real into, into the territory of spiritual. Um, and of course, we at our clinic, we'll, we see all kind of, we see every kind of patient, every kind of person from atheist and agnostic to, to Hindu, Buddhist, Mormon, Muslim, Christian, you know, all across the board. Um, and I understand people have different, they're coming at it from different beliefs or different traditions, I'll say. I come at it from a biblical point of view and I'm, I'm not saying from a religious point of view, I'm looking at that book as a book of truth and it's a fascinating book. I call it a quantum physics, you know, outside of space and time um, book, it's, which that's a whole nother lecture. But that book, and, and that's what's so cool about Caroline Leaf, is she will go sh to, the, to the Bible and that biblical truth of as a man thinketh and, um, and what's in a man's heart. And, you know, what is, whatever is true and righteous and good, think on these things. It's amazing what that book says about our thoughts and how it can impact um, our soul and really our overall health. So you'll have to depend on your beliefs and your philosophy and where you're coming from. You know, you'll have to digest some of that and think through some of that. But I'm going to leave it at this. There's a thought that I believe is truthful, and there's a thought that's not the truth. An example would be, you know, if I was raised in a home where I was rewarded a lot or praised a lot for performing well, like perfect attendance at school, making an all-A honor roll, um, winning a trophy, a uh, soccer tournament, getting a trophy, winning the arts, crafts, and science fair, getting inducted into the National Honor Society, or scoring high on the SAT, and you go on and on and on, then this thought could come in that my value and self-worth is wrapped up in what I do and my performance. Um, well, that's not the truth. The truth is um, I'm a child of God and my value and identity is in that and who he made me to be. That's, a tri that's the thing. When these thoughts can come in, not on purpose, but it's just our culture and the influence of lots of different things. And that's where we have to be real careful because if I live my life um, with that thought of performance, um, equals my um, ability to be loved and accepted and my value, I'm going to make all kinds of decisions in my life that could lead to fight or flight mode. So Lipton brings the science and really so does Lloyd and, and uh, Caroline Leaf. They walk it right up scientifically on these thoughts are super important guys um, and you really need to wrestle with this and make, I mean I can't tell you how to believe but I would highly encourage you um, 
to seek out the truth, and I believe if you seek, you'll find. And those thoughts need to be lined up with the truth. Um, I'll do another video someday more specifically on my personal testimony um, uh, for those who want to hear that. Right now I'm going to leave it with, I encourage you to consider these books possibly or at least listen to the radio interviews and just understand there's thoughts that you could have that are lined up with truth and thoughts that are not true. And when they're not true, it impacts your, your water. So back to the water. The water inside your cell um, encases everything. When Dr. Leaf talks about in her book that DNA double helix is wound up when um, there's thoughts or emotions of anger, fear, and frustration, it's the DNA, the double helix winds up tight. And then when you have thoughts of, of love and peace and joy, that DNA unwinds um, to more of a normal shape. How that actually is happening, the physical changing in, of your DNA, is because the water encases the DNA. That, that double helix is floating in water. And if the water's changing shape, which it is based off of thought and emotion, that's actually physically tugging on and changing the shape of the DNA. And it's not just the DNA proteins in the cell, all your cellular organelles, the mitochondria and the lysosomes and all the different transport proteins, the receptors, the cell membrane itself, it's all water. There's water outside the cell. So when you understand that a thought and a memory impact the shape and structure of that water, then you're impacting the structure of every single system of that cell and the cell's ability to function. Um, one, one other thing I forgot to mention on memories, um, and maybe some of y'all have heard of these anecdotal reports of heart transplant patients and, and really any organ transplant patient, but it seems to be really with heart transplant. These donors that receive a new heart from a... Um, or excuse me, a recipient that receives a new heart from a donor. Um, many anecdotal reports of these recipients waking up and during their recovery process um, post-operatively, they'll start to have memories that are not their own. Memories that are totally not associated with their own known life. Um, and in fact, some skills even come with it, like how to play the violin when they've never played the violin, stuff like that. Um, one case, one report was the memories were so vivid of a murder the, um, the authorities were able to convict the murderer of the victim that donated the heart or the organ to that um, uh, recipient. And so what most doctors who, are, who study this and are more uh, progressive, I'd say, or have a deeper understanding, what we're all starting to see now clearly is the organs and the water in the organs, around the organs, hold our long-term memories. We, so far, science hasn't been able to tell us where long-term memories are stored, so they've done lots of experiments taking out different parts of the brain um, in lab rats, and they haven't been able to take out any part of the brain that removes the long-term memory. Short-term memories, yes, but long-term memories, um, they apparently aren't stored in the brain because we can't find them surgically when we remove the brain. And it appears now that they are stored in the organs around, in the water around each organ. So it's fascinating stuff. And we start to study traditional Chinese medicine. And the Chinese, in, in their system of medicine, they associate different emotions with different organ systems. And these different systems are connected through the acupuncture meridians, which we now know is the fascia. That, that spider web material not only carries water and hydrates you, but it also transfers information. Um, kind of like a superconductor, these electrons at, at, at um, subatomic speeds. It's amazing what the fascia is doing. But energy is flowing through those acupuncture meridians and different emotions are associated with different organs in the Chinese system. And I don't have those memorized, but for example, fear could be in the liver. Um, one quick, I think we have time for an anecdotal story. Um, when I was first learning just integrative medicine eight years ago, um, I was so focused on the gut and nutrition, which obviously is super important, and the gut bugs. And what I was really honed in on was the fact that we'd killed off so many of our good bacteria, the probiotics, the beneficial bacteria in our gut, with antibiotics basically, but other things can do it too. And then a high sugar, high grain diet will feed candida. Candida is a form of yeast or fungus. So we get an imbalance. We get a lot of candida and not enough good bacteria. That candida can travel and move throughout the body, settle in different places in the body, like your joints or the liver or the arteries. 
and where those bugs settle, the immune system will come in and fight them and try to uh, get rid of them. That creates the inflammatory response. When the immune system's fighting, fighting, fighting the, these bugs that are settled in your joints or your sinuses, or your prostate or wherever, inflammation occurs. And we all know now inflammation is the common denominator. So I had a patient come see me. Um, again, this was early on. And Dr. Lee Cowden, who at the time, um, he's retired now, but he was a president of the Academy of Conference of Integrative Medicine, brilliant doctor, a cardiologist by training. And he basically goes around the world teaching doctors how to practice integratively. And he had come to Lubbock to um, visit, and I thought he was just coming for the morning. I'd cleared my morning, we had lunch, and then I thought he was leaving. And he said, no, I'm staying for the day. And so I felt um, a little awkward because I had patients that afternoon, and he was still around. and thought, well, I guess you could see these patients with me, but I don't really know what I'm doing compared to you because <laughs> you're the expert. So anyways, he sat in on this case with me, and it was a lady um, who was about 55 years old and had just been recently diagnosed with diabetes. Now, this lady was trim and thin, and she'd been diagnosed with diabetes because her blood sugar was 800, and basically she had no insulin left. And that's pretty much uh, a type 1 diabetic. So type 2 diabetes is usually the obese patient, and they're insulin resistant. And they have plenty of insulin, but it's just not making the connection like we talked about before. And so over time, their blood sugar starts to slowly go up. That's type 2. Well, she was acting like a type 1. Type 1 is when your pancreas that makes your insulin gets just killed. Your immune system kills the pancreas. You make no more insulin, so all of a sudden your sugar just jumps up to like 800. That's how she was acting. So the doctors in the hospital had put her on insulin, called her a type 1, which is unusual at 55 years old to be diagnosed as type 1. But anyway, she was. So after about two hours of visiting and questioning and, and everything I did, and I basically came down to the conclusion was, I think there's candida in your pancreas because she had totally knocked out her gut flora with tons of antibiotics, and she was drinking a lot of Coke every day and eating a standard American diet. So tons of sugar, tons of antibiotics, killed her flora. If she fed candida, and I just basically told her, candida's in your pancreas. Your immune system went in, in to get it. Collateral damage killed your pancreas. We'll call it an autoimmune disease, but I think that's what happened. And then after two hours of all this, I turned to Dr. Cowden and I said, Dr. Cowden, do you have anything to add um, or any input? And he asked her one question. And he said, when was the sweetness robbed from your life? And of course, in that moment, I had no idea about emotions playing a part in all this and the water and all, I had no clue. And I just thought, well, that's a crazy question. Um, and I thought the patient was going to think it was crazy, and she's going to think we're all crazy. <laughs> and anyways, she kind of looked at him like, what do you mean? And he, he asked her again, what, when was the thing taken from you that brought you the most joy and sweetness? And she just broke down crying. And she said that her granddaughter that she had raised like it was her daughter because her, her real daughter had skipped. She was a drug addict and, and was just gone and absent and, and skipped town. And so the grandmother had to raise the granddaughter um, for 13 years. And then mom came back in the picture and took the, this granddaughter away. And it devastated the grandmother, um, absolutely devastated her. And they had no communication, didn't know where she was. And this happened just prior to. So what Dr. Cowden told me, he said, Ben, you're probably right. There's probably candida and some parasites. Um, and you can treat that with diet and with antiparasiticals and antifungals and herbs and all that stuff. And you'll get some improvement or blood sugars will come down some. But he said, you can kill alligators all day long, but if you don't drain the swamp, the alligators come back. And I was scratching my head at that comment, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, these bugs will only come to a, a cell or tissue that's vibrating at an abnormal frequency. And he reminded me that all cells are made of atoms, and atoms, I think we talked about last time, atoms like a nitrogen atom or carbon or hydrogen, or they have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and then electrons buzz around, orbit around that nucleus. Electrons are negatively charged particles in motion, so they're vibrating, they're in motion. That creates an EMF frequency. And what Dr. Cowden said is when you have an emotion like bitterness and unforgiveness, it causes those electrons to vibrate at a different frequency. And it's the abnormal frequency that will attract the toxins, and the toxins attract the bugs. So he said, you can kill bugs all day long. You can, either, you can even detox the toxins, and you'll get some amount of benefit. But ultimately, 
you've got to deal with the unresolved emotional conflict to get that vibrational frequency back to the normal original intent. I would say the original intent, intent of God and biblically speaking, you know, God spoke everything into existence. Let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. And the vibrational frequency, that spoken word, I think everything has a normal original intent um, frequency to it. And we're off from that. So bottom line, <clears throat> this lady um, did the antiparasiticals, antifungals. Her blood sugars did come down. She, I won't get into the details, but had physical symptoms and findings, laboratory findings consistent with parasites and candida, and she improved. However, she was never able to resolve the unresolved emotional conflict. And to this day, eight years later, she still suffers from that diabetes. Dr. Cowden's a really wise man, a very experienced doctor, um, and he's a president of the academy. And I believe him when he says you won't get fully well until you get the vibrational frequencies right. How that relates to hydration, though, and the, the connection I'm trying to make with you on your thoughts and unresolved emotion is it will change the structure of the water in your cell. So you can do some of the practical steps I'm about to share with you on restructuring your water, and I recommend you do them. And try to drink water that's structured and has vitality and has energy, has a charge. Um, all water found in nature is structured. Uh, Rainwater, water going down a brook, spring water, water inside a vegetable is structured. Um, and we need to drink this natural, naturally occurring water as best we can. Adding sea salt to water starts the structuring process. Um, so do all those practical things. But my number one recommendation is going to be to keep your water structured is to keep your thoughts lined up with the truth. And really the thought I've had lately with the whole COVID-19 and our country shutting down the hospitals being overwhelmed, um, and yes, there's a lot of natural therapies that can be beneficial. I was on a conference call with some Italian doctors last week about ozone and the benefits of IV ozone. I was on a call just this morning with a doctor in China reporting his um, the improvements he's seen with doing IV ozone, which ozone's oxygen. Vitamin C, we've talked about iodine. There's all these great therapies that support the body's natural healing abilities. But ultimately, I mean, what if you didn't have access to that? If it was just you and your thoughts, what if our, you, the country was so shut down and doctor's offices and natural doctor's offices and you couldn't get to your vitamin C or whatever, didn't have access? I believe the thoughts are the most powerful therapy. Sorry about that. The most powerful therapy there is um, to restructure your water. So be encouraged, even when you can't get every single physical thing right, um, and I'm not saying ignore the physical, but your thoughts are going to be able to make up a lot of ground, potentially all the ground, for the things in the physical you're not able to do. A few quick resources here. Hydration Summit. These are, I think it's about 30 different top doctors around the world who talk about water. If you are real interested in everything or anything I've been talking about, a lot of it will be on here, but a deeper dive. Um, some really interesting folks on the Hydration Summit. Um, before I go to practical tips, here's more resources. <clears throat> the podcast, I've mentioned them before, VeritasMedical.com. You can go to resource pay tab and then go down to radio shows. Look up Tom Cowan in the search bar. Um, there's three or four interviews with him, Gina Bria, Patrick Durkin, Gerald Pollack, and then Andrew Salisbury. That's a fascinating interview about coffee. And coffee is actually very medicinal. I used to not drink coffee. Uh, kind of is a prideful thing for me. Everyone said once I got into medical school, I'd have to drink coffee to stay awake, to stay up all night and study and be, be on call. So I took it as a challenge and I never drank coffee. Um, my wife did and I still never did even after I got married. And then I heard this interview with Andrew Salisbury and he talked about all the health benefits of coffee. And it's amazing. Um, it's one of the healthiest things in the world to do but your coffee needs to be sourced properly. And so what he talks about on the interview, definitely you want organic. Coffee is the most sprayed um, crop and second to tobacco. And so you want organic because the coffee bean is going to soak up all that pesticide and chemical um, like a sponge. And then you want it harvested properly, picked at the right time. You want it roasted at just the right um, temperature and the right length of time to release all the beneficial compounds 
and to diminish the potential cancer-causing compounds. There's this sweet spot on the roasting, and he talks all about that. And the name of his coffee, I think, yeah, here it is, Purity Coffee. Um, and it's a great tasting coffee too, but extremely beneficial for your health. Uh, that's on VeritasMarket.com. It's one of the, the affiliates. Uh, the Hydration Summit there, HydrationFoundation.org. There's the doctor's prescription for hydration. That's Gina Bria. I think I have a screenshot of that. Yeah. So there's Gina Bria. That's her website, HydrationFoundation.org. The summit's on there, but also that prescription for hydration. It's just some simple steps that you can take. Um, it's like a 16-minute video. And then the Wellness Enterprise, it's a great resource. They have lots of different water filtration systems. Um, so here's good, better, and best for your water. You want it clean, number one. So filtered is good. Um, RO is probably the best filter. However, RO takes everything out, including the good minerals, and it devitalizes. So there's no more energy, no more electrons, no more minerals. But it's clean, so it's better than not clean. So the next step up after you clean it is mineralize, remineralize that water. So a lot of RO systems, you can get them with a remineralizing cartridge. After it cleans it, it'll remineralize it. And then third step, good, better, best, is structured. So clean, then mineralized, and then structured. And there are devices that do all three. The structuring is just a vortex um, device that causes that water to flow through a certain physical vortex and it causes that water to start to structure again. But the Wellness Enterprise has a lot of different systems there. They vet a lot of different companies and I trust uh, what they do. So practical tips. Um, first, be careful. Avoid almost all store-bought liquids. Juice in particular is high in sugar. Of course, all the sodas are high in sugar. And if it says sugar-free, that means they put in an artificial sweetener. Most of those are off limits. If it ends in OL, like erythritol, xylitol, the sugar alcohols are okay. I wouldn't do them routinely all the time. They can disrupt your gut flora. If it's sweetened with stevia, that would be okay, or monk fruit, that would be okay. Um, but be, otherwise, the sugar-free, you got to be super careful because it's going to be NutraSweet or um, Splenda, sucralose. The good, better, and best I mentioned already. And remember quality over quantity. I would much rather you drink quality than quantity. Um, so if all I have access to is bottled water that's from a tap somewhere and it's in that real soft, crinkly um, plastic, the louder and softer that plastic is, that's a cheap plastic, and that plastic is leaching chemical into that water. You put it in sunlight, I mean, if you're at a convenience store and those bottles of packets of water out on the front of the convenience store sidewalk, just the light, the sunlight beating down on them, it's leaching all that chemical from the plastic. So don't do that. I prefer glass like this Topo Chico. Um, that's a glass bottle. Um, and you're not going to have to deal with a chemical leach into that. Um, and I also like this. I mean, it is uh, carbonated, so it has the bubbly, fizzy stuff, and that's okay. Um, but it's got minerals in it. It's mineral water, and that's why I drink it. Um, and this one happens to be lime-flavored. Remember to eat your water, smoothies, chia seed pudding, raw veg vegetables. Um, eat something hydrating if you are eating something dehydrating. Doctor up your beverages. Um, every morning, I get a glass of structured water from my sink. I put a pinch of sea salt, apple cider vinegar, and um, a squeeze of lime. All of those will start the structuring process. Now, it's not going to turn it all the way to jello, but it will start making some of those molecules H3O2, um, and you want that. It will absorb better. You will hydrate your cells better. You, there's these aquapores or these little channels in the cell membrane that allow H3O2 to come through into your cell better than H2O. And I have a lot of patients will report to me, they can guzzle just regular H2O all day long out in the heat here in West Texas and they just don't feel like they're hydrating, but they drink out of a structured water bottle, which the Wellness Enterprise has some of those too, and they will feel hydrated. They can go all day on um, just a few bottles of that. But back to spicing up your beverages, like your tea or your coffee. So I put cinnamon, clove, um, nutmeg, cardamom. These are very beneficial um, spices, and just start looking at ways to add these um, extra things into your drink, into your tea and your coffee, or into your water. Try to get more than just the water when you can. Um, again, there's the course, the other resources there. I'll leave that there. Um, 
Okay, so let's wrap this up in a nutshell. Um, drink mostly water. Fresh squeezed juice is fine, but store-bought juice is not. It's pure sugar. Carbonated beverages are fine. They do make some stevia sweetened sodas um, and erythritol sweetened sodas. Those are okay if you need them. You can make your own. Um, you know, my kids love to get the Perrier water or San Pellegrino water, and they'll put um, orange stevia drops in it, make their own orange flavored soda, so to speak. Um, so there's lots of things you can do. You know, chopping up fruit or like cucumbers, different vegetables, watermelon put them into a big jug of water and let it sit there all night long and you'll get some of those natural flavors from the fruit. Um, there's ways to make it fun and make it flavorful if you don't like just straight water. You can even find decent water at the grocery store. If you're down to just uh, like a convenience store and all they have is bottled water, um, it, try to at least find the water that's in a stiffer water bottle like the Fiji. If you notice how kind of firm that water bottle is compared to some of the real cheap flimsy plastic, that'll be better. Um, move, get up, and we'll talk more about movement next week, but squat, bend, twist, jump, walk, you know, get up every hour and move, super important. Eat your water, get that chia seed pudding recipe. You can doctor that up with chocolate or vanilla or butterscotch or whatever flavor you want. Um, it's a great way to be hydrated. Coconut water is super good instead of Gatorade or Powerade. Those are full of sugar. Um, so get some coconut water. There's different um, brands out there and there's good, better, and best probably there too. But they even make dehydrated coconut water. So these little packets or big pouches of powdered um, coconut water. Just put it in a water bottle, shake it up. There's all different flavors. Your sports teams, your kids, your grandkids, instead of Gatorade, coconut water. I mean, when you're in Africa on a mission trip and there's dehydrated kids with cholera, if you give them that coconut water, it has the electrolytes in it that will rehydrate them well, just like IV fluid will. Um, so I really like coconut water. Put a little extra sea salt in it and a squirt of lime, especially if you're more stressed. We call that an adrenal cocktail. Um, the adrenal glands uh, produce 50 different hormones, and a lot of those are your fight or flight hormones. And they need the whole food vitamin C and they need the minerals. So sea salt, squirt of lime, coconut water. That's called an adrenal cocktail on a day where you're a little more uh, stressed out. Ultimately though, I encourage you to work on your thoughts and get your thoughts lined up with the truth. Know who you are. Um, you know, wrestle with those questions if you aren't sure about God. Is there a God? Did he r really make you? Did he make this whole universe? Are you here for a purpose? You know, all those deep personal questions, I encourage you to walk through that. Um, and seek that out and I think God will meet you there and then once you have submitted to that um, I'd encourage you to dive into that Bible again not talking necessarily church um, but that personal relationship with the truth and really study that Bible as the instruction book of life and you'll be amazed at how it will change your thoughts and how those thoughts being lined up with the truth will change the structure of the water in your cell so Hydration, obviously, way more than eight glasses of water a day. Go get hydrated, eat your water, line up your thoughts with the truth, move around a little bit, and be well. And get with those wellness navigators. They are well-versed in these hydration steps. They are well-versed in smoothie recipes, for instance, um, ways to eat your water. Um, so get with them. Um, utilize the heck out of them. They are available to you. That's why they're part of the program here. So hope, hopefully y'all are using them. And any questions y'all have too, y'all can post to them. And if they don't know, they can get them to me and I can address them um, either directly to you or next week on the video. We can do that um, if there are any questions today. No? Okay. All right, guys. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Um, hope it wasn't too much. Hope it didn't get too weird for you. But it's the truth. Um, you are mostly water. And the type of water you consume and the way you live and think impacts that water so much. And so it's these basic things that we can do to be healthy and to bolster your ability to be resistant and resilient to chronic disease and acute infections both. So be at peace. Uh, trust your body. Trust the design of the body. Just steward it. Just give it what it needs and avoid what it doesn't and you'll be well ahead of the curve. So y'all have a great week, and I will see you next week.